Forgot Soldier, Guy Sager, back in Chapter 13. Here's my beautiful balcony in the beautiful city of downtown Chicago. The most beautiful city in the world. Let's get back to work. In the motionless cold of the polar night, we covered the rigid corpses with snow, marked, marked, marking each improvised grave with a stick and a helmet. There's no time for sentiment or reflection. Those who were still to their astonishment among the living were trying to shake off the general numbness enough to start our solidly frozen engines. The situation seemed desperate. Not one of the engines turned over. Feldvevel Sperlovsky stamped down on the pedals of his Suntap motorcycle, which resisted his, the pressure his 190 pounds of flesh and bone could still bear to bring, and then cracked like a piece of dead wood. The metal itself seemed to be affected. We lit fires under the panzers to try to thaw them slowly before making any attempt to start them. For the cursing, gasping Lancer, the effort was immense, straining our congestive lungs, which whistled and rattled. Vice Rydow himself was impatient. He had wrapped his boots in rags picked up during the retreat. We should have kept at least one engine running all night he explained. It's elementary. This sort of carelessness could ruin all of us. We listened to him with expressionless faces. Undoubtedly, se undoubtedly several among us would have regarded death as a deliverance. An hour or so later, we heard the asthmatic backfire of an engine. Someone had managed to start one of the half-tracks. The driver let it warm up for a while and set to work on the gearbox, which had not yet thought. After two hours of intense effort, our column set out under orders to maintain the lowest possible speed. Until the machines had reached a certain minimum temperature, we had to limp after them on foot. At midday, there were several breakdowns, and the convoy had to stop. The radiator hoses of several vehicles had been damaged by the pure alcohol in the radiators, and we had to repair them using spare parts if we were fortunate enough to have them. Otherwise, we patched them up as best we could. While the work was in progress, we opened some cans of solidly frozen food. Meat which could be chopped with an axe. A, pure of, a puree of peas and soya with the consistency of cement. And a solid brick of wine. Our enforced stop cost us an hour. According to radio instructions, we had one more hour to rejoin the main body of troops. We were crossing the territory of one of our interior defense posts. Two round block houses and three or four huts built into the ground. No one came out to meet us, and the place seemed deserted. However, a plume of smoke was rising from one of the block houses. No doubt the men inside were asleep besides a warm fire. We set a small group over to investigate. Five minutes later, one of them ran back to the column, his breath spreading around his face in white clouds when he reached us. He stopped and gasping. Everyone, everything in there has been destroyed, Herr Hafman, and everyone is dead. It's terrible. Every gray face filled with anxiety. Looking more closely, we saw that the doors of the Isba had all been knocked in and that four or five bodies lay beside one of the huts. Partisans! someone shouted. Six men recently killed. There's been fighting here recently, Herr Hoffman. Those, those bandits must be must still be holding their guns. Another detachment went into the second blockhouse. There was a long, echoing explosion. And a geyser of earth and snow and fragments of wood shot into the air over the building. Vice Rideout cursed aloud and ran toward the smoking bunker. We followed him. Three men had just been torn to pieces. Two were unrecognizable, while the third was gasping his last breath, rattling as the blood spurted from his body. Mixed into the rubble lay the body of four German soldiers who had been killed before we arrived. 
Watch out for mines, Vice right out shout. The word passed from mouth to mouth. Soldiers stopped at the door of the second blockhouse and looked in without daring to enter. Six men, who had been stripped almost naked and hideously mutilated, were lying in pools of black congealed blood. Some of the mutilations were so horrible we couldn't look at them. Two soldiers, men who had fought outside of Moscow, at Kursk, Bryansk, and Belgorod, and seen appalling horrors, hid their faces in their hands and walked away. None of us had ever seen anything so gratuitously horrible. Taking infinite precautions, a section removed the cadavers. Two of them had been booby-trapped. We covered their bodies with debris, as we, we had neither the means nor the time to dig the graves. To all of us, the tactics of the partisans seemed more ignoble and senseless than anything else we'd seen. Vice Rydal led a ceremony of final farewell to the 18 massacred men. We removed our hats and caps and helmets and stood bareheaded in the snow. Ich hat einen Kameraden. Our funeral song rang through the Stone Age setting of Russian winter with the discordant sonorities of thousands of voices. There are no flags or fanfares, only profound consternation. The spirit of revenge motivating the terrorists further destroyed the fragments of understanding so far spared by the war. Our men could not accept it. If they could still bear the torment of the trenches with heroic resolution, they could not accept the treachery of the partisans. Our column set out again. As we passed the center blockhouse, we saw the coarse placard thrust in the snowy mound. Across it scrawled in charcoal, we read the word, REVENGE. We drove out for another hour. The snow, which deadened the noise of our vehicles, also intensified distant sounds. Suddenly we heard the crackle of automatic weapons. Vice Rydell, together with our two other officers, orders us to halt. Immediately we heard the noise of firing more distinctly. Some five miles to the west, fighting was in progress. We were ordered forward on the double. The tank crews wanted to go on ahead and rush to the scene of combat, but our officers couldn't allow them to leave the column. We had to stay together with our tank tractors, each pulling three Russian sleighs loaded with men and equipment. The half-tracks helped the trucks, which would never have been able to make it alone. I was riding in the third sleigh in one of these trains. Behind us was a large sidecar whose transmission was failing. The tanks were pulling with full power to the great peril of their own mechanisms. The crackle of guns grew continuously louder. Suddenly, Vicerado stopped the convoy and jumped down to check his maps. Everyone on the sleighs was ordered to follow him, and I found myself going into action once again. The Panzers detached themselves from their trains and drove toward the noise. We followed, running as fast as we could, waved forward by Weissreidau, who came with us in a large BMW sidecar. A Steiner uh, with an 80mm mortar skidded past us in a cloud of whirling snow. Gasping for breath, we ran along the track made by the tanks. They had pulled far ahead of us and entered into combat with the enemy some ten minutes before we reached the scene of fighting. We could hear the machine guns ripping into the air, sounding much louder than usual. The sidecar came back toward us and suddenly spun around. Spread out into the forest! We carried out the order, some of us remaining behind to pull out the sidecar which was stuck in a drift before running on through the trees, standing up straight as massive ships. The virgin snow rasped and crackled under great sheets under our weight. We could no longer see the tanks which seemed to be pursuing an enemy in flight. We didn't meet any partisans ourselves. Twenty minutes later, a flare called us to the nearby blockhouse, which was like every other. It was supposed to guard the track, which in normal times was heavily used. The post had been attacked by partisans, which of course we had to expect, probably the same band that had massacred the men we found earlier. Here, fortunately, there had been time for the defense to react. Of the 22 men holding the post, six had been wounded and two killed. 
Some 20 enemy dead or wounded lay on the trampled snow. There are also several guns, Russian and German, and some American. A few wounded partisans were trying to crawl into the forest. No order could have stopped our men. They fired at the Russians and put an end to their suffering. Two shaggy prisoners had fallen into our hands. Their eyes rolled wildly like the eyes of trapped wolves. And they answered our questions with absurd, repetitive replies. We are not communists. What did they take us for? Did they really know nothing? That, of course, was possible. They looked like beasts being dragged to slaughter. No talk was possible. Our men were muttering for revenge. The vice Rydow looked at the partisans and then at us. He tried a little longer to get something from the prisoners, but his efforts were unavailing. Finally, his patience exhausted, he raised his arm with feigned indifference. Our men grabbed the two prisoners and pushed them along in front of us. The human wolves looked back, snarling, but the sight of our guns made them lose their heads. They began to run and ran into the first volley, caught them, and knocked them to the ground. The post had been saved at the last possible moment. According to the men who'd been there, at least 400 partisans had attacked them, and the fighting had lasted two hours. The men greeted us with bear hugs. They were overjoyed to hear we had brought an evacuation order with us. For the moment, we seemed to be acting as the last broom of the Fairbank, making a clean sweep. To crown the misery of the day, a hideous incident occurred within 10 minutes of our departure from that place. The side car at the head of the column preceding the first tank by some 30 to 40 yards drove back onto the track, moving through the snow with considerable difficulty. A tank followed it, rolling over the same ground. Suddenly, an explosion shook the earth and reverberated through the air. Frozen snow showered down with crystalline sound from the heavily laden branches all around us. The tank had been blown off its tracks and torn open from below. We could hear the roar of flames as fat plumes of smoke rolled out from beneath the machine, spreading over the icy ground. The men in the sleighs which followed reacted immediately. One of the junior officers jumped onto the turret of the tank to try to free the frantic men inside, who were probably seriously wounded. Others ran to help, while the infantry spread out on the other side of the room to be ready for any eventuality. By now, the tank was wrapped in thick black smoke, and we could do nothing to help the trapped men. We emptied three extinguishers onto blackened metal, but the flames inside only increased in violence. The 40 gallons of flaming gasoline, which spread out across the snow, in a panic, the scorched lancer yielded to the fire, whose black flumes of smoke were climbing into the dark side. In helpless anger, officers and men alike watched the immolation of three men. The smell of burned flesh mingled ignominiously with the smell of gas and oil. The two men in the lead sidecar had passed over the same spot a few seconds before the tank. Their tires must have missed the detonator of the partisan's mine by only an inch or two. They also watched the hideous scene with cold sweat running down their spines. The column abandoned the burning tank, whose flames had begun to make its ammunition explode. We also abandoned three heavy sleighs and some of our materiel, which we burned. The men who had ridden in the sleighs found places on other vehicles. We all made a wide detour to avoid the exploding machine gun bullets. We left behind the tomb of two men who had been killed without a chance to defend themselves. Two men who had three years of fighting behind them and who deserved Valhalla. We abandoned the territory to the red waves that followed us. This was the final passage of the last European crusade in the complete sense of the word. The piercing cold was a continuous element we could never forget. 
even during moments of strong emotion, as in our recent clash with the partisans. A short time later, we rejoined the division in a town of a certain size and importance called Voporovskia, if I remember correctly. Between the trenches and the barbed wire, the engineers and the tote organization were busy mining the area. Other infantry regiments and an armored union equipped with tiger panzers had also reached this point. A dozen of these motionless monsters seemed to be grinning at us as they watched the passage of our battered equipment. The presence of the tigers reassured everyone. They were like steel fortresses, and no Russian tank could equal them. Several Wehrmacht civil servants had been billeted at Boporevska. These gentlemen were surprised and displeased to find themselves suddenly at the center of a battlefield. They all seemed to be in an extremely bad humor, and their attitude toward us seemed tinged with a certain distrust. Perhaps their bureaucratic minds resented our fighting as we retreated. For them, Russia meant this organized town where one could shelter from the coal and eat one's fill, provided one had established the proper connections with supply. Perhaps there was also charming evenings with the charming Ukrainian women who seemed to abound in these parts. These ladies and girls seem to be preparing for a hasty departure in the company of their gentleman friends to look for a distant and more tranquil spot. We, it seemed, would be given the honor of defending these bureaucratic love nests. This attitude infuriated us, and many brawls began, but were quickly stifled. In the end, we were too exhausted and hungry to bother with these people, and occupied the warm ispas we were given with great satisfaction. In the ispas, we found food and drink and the opportunity to wash. Our cabins were rarely equipped with candles and lamp, but the flames in the fireplace, which we fed with every combustible substance we could find, brilliantly lit these fragments of paradise. Within a few hours of our arrival, several cubic yards of snow had melted off each billet, and we were stripped naked, all of us, scrubbing off our filth as best we could. We soaked our trousers, underwear, shirts, tunics, with feverish, almost panicky haste. Our opportunity would certainly be brief, and everyone wished to make the most of it. Someone had even found a box full of small cakes of toilet soap. These were mixed into the water of the largest tubs. In turn, time by stopwatch, we plunged into the warm, foaming bath. Two minutes each, and no overtime. We joked and larked as we had for months. The water spilled over the edge of the tub and flooded the big room where some 30 shadowy figures cavorted. We kept pouring water into the tubs to keep the level up. The dim light prevented us from noticing that the foam, which so delighted us, had turned gray with filth. However, our lice died a scented death. Mary Rose. When we had finished washing, we emptied the tubs into a hole we had dug outside the Ispa. There was no question of going outside. The thermometer registered 20 degrees below zero and everyone was naked. When the water was gone, we broke up the tubs and burned them. The fire had voracious appetite, which was difficult to satisfy. Howells was exultantly chewing a fragment of soap, laughing and shouting that he had to clean his innards too, as they are probably just as filthy and overrun with lice as his skin. Now the pop-offs can come whenever they like, he shouted. I feel like a new man. The door suddenly opened, letting in a blast of astonishing cold. Everyone howled in protest. Two soldiers stood in the threshold, their arms loaded with delicacies for the table. We gaped at this gift from heaven as the soldiers laid down their burden of a pile of damp overcoats, a string of spicy wurst, several loaves of gingerbread, several boxes of Norwegian sardines, a brick of smoked bacon, there are also eight or ten bottles, schnapps, cognac, Rhine wine, and cigars. The fellows kept right on empty in the huge pockets of their coats, and our shouts of astounded delight seemed to shake the flimsy walls. What, uh, where, where did you find it? 
Somebody asked, almost sobbing with joy. Those goddamn bureaucrats were really living it up. Gransk, our company cook, never saw anything like this. Those bastards were keeping it all here. They were ready to run off with it, too. This is just a small sample, but they're all as mad as hornets. Said they'd report us for stealing personal possessions. Who the hell do they think they're fooling? They can't take their goddamn report. And any time they like, I'll tell them what they can do with it. To hell with them. Everyone plunged into this astonishing mouth of delicacies. Hal's eyes were starting out of his head. Keep my share for a minute, he said, putting on his damp clothes. I've got to have a look for myself and bring back some more. Those bastards think they're going to leave us to take care of the front while they clear out with all this delicatessen, for God's sake? Hals wrapped himself in a Soviet aider down and rushed out into the cold. Solma, a young fellow who was half Hungarian and had joined the regiment under more or less the same circumstances as I had, went with him. When they had gone, Pastor Ferham, aided by Obergefreiter Lenzen and Hoth, Lenzen's number two man at the Panzerfaust, divided up the food. We had to hack the bacon with our picks because our bayonets were too blunt. Pfefferham, who must have left some of his religious convictions on the east bank of the Dnieper, along with his virginity, was swearing like a pagan. To think that this damn thing, which has already poked holes in plenty of guts, should be stopped by a goddamn piece of bacon. Borrow some dynamite from Tote if you have to, but hurry it up with it. No one was cheated. The amazing sense of comradeship and unity of the Fairmacht held, and everyone received a fair share. The war had brought together men from many different regions and walks of life, who would probably have mistrusted each other under any circumstances. But the circumstances of war united us in a symphony of heroism, in which each man felt himself to a certain extent responsible for all his fellows. The bureaucratic attitude which had been preserved in this relatively peaceful atmosphere astonished rather than shocked us. We felt that it was perfectly legitimate to plunder these stockpiles of hoarded goods. The sense of order, which was part of National Socialism, was still very much alive among the troops who were fighting for it. Those who appropriated delicacies for themselves while combat troops were dying of hunger seemed to belong to another species. Pfefferham spoke of all this as he ate, comparing these officials to the bourgeoisie Hitler speaks of in Mein Kampf. Combat troops have immediate concern. For men living the lives of hunted beasts, all leisurely conversation is a waste of time. We had to eat and drink what and when we could, and make love when we could, without taking any time for eloquence over the girl's hair or eyes. Every moment was precious. Every hour might be our last. Hals and Solma's shares waited for them inside their helmets, which were turned upside down. We sang as we emptied the bottles. Our friends who'd gone out for more didn't come back, and later Hals cursed that impulse. He and Solma had been caught pinching some cognac from one of the bureaucrats, which meant six days of detention for both of them. Still knocked, hell knocked, or fine knocked. Christmas night, 1943. The wind howled through the labyrinth of trenches north of Boporevskaya. Two companies occupied the positions prepared by the security division and the TOF organization, which had since withdrawn to the west, beyond the Bessarabian frontier. We had settled into these ice-coated molehills two days earlier. The front seemed solid. We would almost certainly be fighting soon. The collapse of our southern front had forced this last retreat and regrouping along this line. The vast Soviet thrust was moving inexorably and slowly toward us, like a steamroller. We were well aware of this, and the continuous buildup of reinforcements in our sector led us to foresee a violent clash. 
the country immediately around us was hilly and wooded. Tanks and mobile artillery waited in the frozen underbrush and terrible cold, which stripped the bark off trees. The stocks of, precision, of provisions in the Vopar of Skaya had been repeatedly plundered. Our commandant had tacitly consented to a few days of carousal, as if to compensate for the impending holocaust. It was Christmas night. Despite our miserable circumstances, we were filled with emotion like children who have been deprived of joy for a very long time. Under our steel helmets and behind our silent faces moved a crowd of glittering memories. Some men talked of peace, others of childhoods, trying to hide their feelings and hopeless ludicrous dreams by hardening their voices. Vice Dow made his round of the trenches, talking to the men, but his words seemed only to be disturbing private reflections and he soon withdrew into his own. He, too, undoubtedly had children and wished to be with them. Sometimes he stopped for a moment, looked up at the sky, which had cleared. The frost glittered on his long coat like spangles on a Christmas tree. For four days, we had to endure nothing more severe than the cold. The sections of the line were relieved continuously, and the unbearable nights were divided into two parts. Each day brought fresh cases of pneumonia. Frostbite had become commonplace. Twice I was carried into an isp and brought back to consciousness and life from the brink of death. Our faces were badly cracked, particularly the corners of the lips. Fortunately, we had enough to eat. The cooks had been given special orders to prepare our food with as much fat as possible. Supplies arrived regularly, which enabled Graz to produce gluey soups full of margarine. These concoctions were nauseating but effective. Our cooks had learned something about cold with their cooking from the ingredients of Russian soups. We also took saunas, a horse doctor treatment which didn't coddle any weaklings. We moved straight from the hot steam into cold showers and transitioned so violent that our hearts often threatened to stop beating. Like Grant's greasy group soups, however, these shocks were effective. We almost always felt better afterwards. Make the most of it, Grant told us. Eat up and enjoy it. In Germany, kids are going without dessert, so you can have this. Alas, Grant's words were too accurate. As Paul explained in a letter which reached me in only six days, rationing had become very strict. We were getting much closer to our own frontier, and every day the distance from home seemed smaller. Soon Germany at bay would no longer be able to send us even margarine. One morning, the Feldfabel's whistles drove us from the overheated ISPA where we slept. A patrol of Soviet tanks was just over a mile from Bukhariskaya. The cold as we ran outside was like a blow from the butcher's act. Each man galloped to precise point. We had not yet reached our position when the sound of heavy explosions shook the thin air to the west of us. Russian tanks, charging like maddened bulls, had driven into our minefield. Now it was the turn of the Russian tank crews to gulp and smoke. Our observers were watching through their field glasses. Almost all the tra tanks were trying to withdraw the way they'd come. Our artillery, our artillery remained silent, leaving the tanks to the mines. Firing might even set off these traps. 